I started a track this week. Did you? Yeah, I did. And then I, I liked it so much that I ended up using it for my video that I just put up. So you selfish um, son of a bitch. I am a selfish, selfish person. Um, so we don't have a intro track again. You know what? Here, here's what we should do. Um, we'll count to three. And on three, you, dear listener or viewer, hum uh, your own intro track. Ready? One, two, three, four. Great. There it is. Pretty good. <laughs> uh, what's All up, right. everyone? Welcome to uh, Dipped in Tone episode... Uh, what are we Eight. on? Eight? Oh, my God. It's crazy. <laughs> I'm Rhett. I'm Zach. And, um, yeah, thanks for joining us. If you're new to the, the channel or to the podcast, subscribe on YouTube or on your uh, preferred podcast listening platform. I'm going to move this mic so I'm not getting plosives. Oh. Um, oh, my God. Did you hear that? I saw my screen go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Speak- oh, go ahead. I was going to say, we've got, uh, we've got our Discord uh, live chat going here with everyone. If you want to join the Discord while we're recording and listen to us live, you can... Uh, join our patreon for two dollars a month link down below it's so cheap <laughs> so cheap it's half a starbucks coffee yeah you know what is not cheap the iphone 12 pro i just bought to Thank finally you. enter the land of living apparently <laughs> welcome to the 21st century my friend and um as as the uh the self-proposed selfish person that i am i'm very glad that i no longer have to stare at your green text <laughs> You know, it's funny, like, I used to be like that, you know, and I bought this stupid phone. I mean, I actually, I really like the Google Pixel phone, but I bought it with the intention of using it to play Stadia, which is like Google streaming gaming service, which is kind of cool, but that's a dumb reason to buy a phone. So, uh, but, but recently, whenever uh, I was doing Google's version of FaceTime with Morgan, the screen when we were chatting would just go like and like shake and it sounded like there was a short in my phone it was like like audibly buzzing through the just through the phone so it's time it's time it's time well yeah. again uh, i'm just kidding about that i know i'm probably going to get a bunch of hate comments from android users um <laughs> so zach what's new uh what's what's new with you this week other than the uh the modern uh phone well i mean the uh, <clears throat> ongoing tragedy that is my fence, <laughs> you know, but I don't want to get into that. I've already ranted and raved on Instagram. Uh, just uh, I needed to vent, but right. um, hopefully that'll be over so- soon. But since this will be going out Monday, which will be the 19th, it will be the 10th anniversary of me making my very first meal near. So... And this is not the very first one. Joey actually has that one. But um, Oh, nice. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Is, yeah, crazy. So I'm going to I keep hearing dinging. No, it's me. It's me. Oh, okay. I'm dinging. Um so actually, I think on Instagram I'm going to post um uh, and give this one focus there. Give this one which is like an homage to those first ones away. Oh, nice. So, as uh, Yeah. Yeah, as in honor of that. 10 years, man. Congratulations. Years. That's, uh, a, that's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I say 10 years. I wasn't making them the entire time, <laughs> but that's Still. when I made my first one. So I, it counts. You know? Yeah. But, of course. Uh, but yeah. What about you? What? I, I know you got something fun. I did. I got a, a new old amp this week. I talked about it last week on the show, but um, I bought a 1960 Gibson GA5T Skylark. Um, but it's very not a clean. T. Yeah. It's got tremolo. Oh, it does? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, I just thought it was a five. Cool. No, it's a tremolo. Nice. Um, completely, completely original. A couple of the filter caps have been done, and it's had a three-prong cord put on it, but original speaker, original transformers, original tubes. There's a Bugle Boy uh, in, in the V1 preamp tube section. Um, it's super clean for its age, for being 60 years old. And it sounds badass. It sounds yeah. killer. I just made a video with it. Uh, I just put up like half an hour ago. Right. And under a microphone, 
Uh, it's massive. Yeah. It's huge. That's what I you love know, about those small amps, man. It's it's one of those things with vintage amps. I Sometimes you get purists who don't want anything changed, but you're doing that amp a disservice if you don't service it. Yeah. You know, like the, people go like crazy, like buying proper vintage spec caps and, and whatnot. And they do matter. But like at, at minimum, you have to get rid of the two prong and what was called the death cap. Yep. Um, which if you don't know, if that cap fails, it shunts voltage to your chassis and will actually electrocute you. Um, yeah. So you got to ditch all that and wire it up right. But like in my experience, no vintage amp ever lost its value for having a proper job done to it like that. So you got to do it. You got to do yeah. it. Yeah, and it was a steal, man. I, I paid seven hundred fifty bucks for it, um, which I feel like is a pretty good price. So, yeah, I think that's more than fair. And in the in the condition it's in, it's just going to, going to continue to appreciate. Yep. Um, you know, I bought something old. I think at the end of last week, and I sent you a picture of it. And uh, coming up Monday, I'll be having my my new Mythos analog delay prototypes. But I got. Um, there it goes. This guy, which is a vintage AD80. Nice. And I, th- this thing was sick. It wasn't that expensive. And this thing's going to appreciate in value because this is like, I mean, it's old, uh, made in Japan. It runs on 18 <laughs> volts. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> it's it's so cool. <laughs> heavy. But I have, I have quite the affinity for the red and pink, uh, delay pedals and you have one so there's even more floating around yep. so I, I i'm really excited to get this oh and i got of course i have this lovely thing oh that the 25 dollar uh behringer yeah it's it's not bad except sometimes the spring it crunches mm. so well that's gross whatever but it's yeah 28 bucks 28 bucks Free man come on crazy. don't don't complain <laughs> no. no um i'm gonna bring your pedals back next week uh, Tilly and I are, sure you are. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm serious. Tilly and I are coming up to Nashville next week, so I think next week's episode of the podcast will be in person for the first time ever. Wow. Episode nine. We're gonna have to get one of those like plexiglass, plexiglass things. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um. Well, that's cool, man. Well, you uh, you've got a, a plethora of delays. I'm trying to think what else. Yeah. Oh, I, I also got the um, uh, Mason sent the new uh steel string singer preamp pedal that vertex just came out with um, right i have yet to plug it up just came in the mail yesterday I have not had time but it looks pretty cool and it's it's part of a new trend of pedals i think that i'm really excited to see which is like the preamp amp in a box thing um which i want right. to talk about for just a second but before i do that the dinging i do have a shameless plug here i'm gonna shill for my Uh-oh. own gonna shill is it for coconut my own water stuff. no it's not coconut water <laughs> Um, I have a new series of signature slides that we just released oh, this week. Uh, rock, rock slide? Yeah, with the rock slide. So, um, been working on these. There, uh, there's three of them. There's the aged brass, like this one. This is probably my favorite. There's the amber glass, which is very, very nice. And then nice. there is a, uh, a polished nickel one. And cool. It- yeah, they're, they're close to like their standard, um, slide designs we did on on this one the main changes we made that make it a somewhat signature slide is on the metal ones the um the wall thickness is the thinner wall thickness which uh if if you haven't played much slide the the wall thickness of the slide actually does make a difference in how it plays and how it feels i prefer the thinner wall i feel like i have more control over my intonation um and I can play a little bit faster and it makes the slide a metal slide a little bit lighter having a thinner wall. So that's nice. So, right. um, yeah, check these out. What, what finger do you use? Your um, slide on? Uh, third, I usually go, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Third, just like that. And, and these are cool. I've, I've been using the rock slide stuff for years. I've bought a ton of these over the years. And so if you're not familiar, these are cool because they have a, um, I guess, what would you call that? A chamfered edge or just a, a trimmed edge? Yeah, like a, well, yeah. Yeah, like a, a a space for your joint. <laughs> right. So you can you know you can basically put <laughs> on your out. finger and yeah and and bend it over. Um, 
the metal ones have, and then they're tapered on the inside as well. So as your finger goes up, it actually kind of grips onto your finger and stays in place, which I really dig. Um, so yeah, check right. them out. They'll be linked down below. Sure. I, I physically cannot play slide, but um, everyone I know that does play slide uses rock slide. So I have to assume <laughs> that they're really good. <laughs> uh, so yeah. So we got a couple topics to talk about this week, but I, the the preamp pedal thing was um, one that yeah. just kind of came off the cuff. You and I worked on a preamp pedal last year, the Lark, and um, yeah. it, it's I mean, cool it, to see more companies getting on this uh, this bandwagon here. You know, it's it's an interesting thing because so often so many of us run like always on pedals. So you know, if there's an argument about well, why would you want to have a solid state? pedal preamp but if you're like running a solid state pedal through like your guitar rig always on you're like you're you're kind of doing that and using your amp as like a, just just a a power amplifier in a way yeah um but you know i think there's we've come so far and there's so much more knowledge we have about using fets as tube substitutes and how to run things at higher voltage for the best headroom and the best clarity I think it's something we're going to continue to see, and it's just going to get more and more uh, complex as the years go by. Yeah. It's cool because they're great utility pedals. Um, you know, if you're if you're a guitar player, you know, for years, the only amp I had that I gigged and did everything with was a Port City Pearl, which is, you know, completely clean pedal platform amp. And that's cool because utilizing some of these amp in a box and amp in a box pedals have been around for a long time, but I don't think they've been as full featured as they're kind of getting now with like this vertex pedal and like uh, the color box right. is a little bit different. It's like a recording preamp, but still um, they're great EQs. You can use them as boosts. You can use them as overdrives or fuzzes or always on pedals or, or, you know, you can in some cases put them, you know, maybe through the effects loop of an amp to kind of revoice the amp. I mean, they're really cool. Uh, we should do an episode on like utility pedals or utility gear, you know, one piece of gear that sure. can do a lot, cover a lot of ground, you know, I think that's, that's really valuable. Yeah. I mean, have you seen that the Dr. Robert pedal that was like, no, it's like an exact replica of the, oh, it's, it's like a, a like almost a component, component, component to component recreation of the, the amps that the Beatles used on like the white album, the Vox amps. Nice. And, like, you know, like, and it they sound pretty phenomenal. So uh, you know, it's it's pretty it's pretty amazing just like seeing where we started with those sort of things with like the Carl Martin like plexi drive, those big things yep. like evolving into like now what we have, uh, you know, features that no one ever even thought to add right ten twenty years ago. Right. Yeah. Super cool. So yeah, uh, yeah. you uh, you want to jump on our first topic here? Sure. So, first topic is it belongs in a museum. <laughs> Do you think that, that the guitars of our heroes, living or dead? <laughs> that that's from right. Uh, that's from the Last Crusade. If you don't know, right? Uh, Do you think the guitar heroes, uh, the guitars of our heroes, living or dead, should be exhibited for all to see? It's a shame how many amazing things live in collections or cases. Yeah. Okay, That's, so I've got some thoughts on this. You know. um, sure. So, when Songbirds Museum was still a thing, it was uh, it was a really impressive museum, and it was a really impressive collection. It's a private collection, as far as I understand it. Private collection owned by one person, um, and the the museum was a paid like you bought tickets to go in they had different tiers right you had the general admission area which was kind of just the main area and then if you wanted to go back and see like the vault or or anything like that you had to pay extra and i played a gig there about two years ago it was a really fun gig but um our green room was that sort of like vault area in the back of, of songbirds. If you've been to songbirds you know what i'm what i'm talking about and at the time yeah. in that area they had an exhibit on uh the women of rock and roll and their instruments and they had one of carol Kay's basses they had um apparently it was sister rosetta's rosetta tharp's actual sg custom her white sg custom oh man 
Uh, they had Elizabeth Cotton's um, Triple O. I think I think her Martin was a Triple O. I can't. I, I always get confused on Martin models. Anyway, it was a bunch of like iconic instruments played by iconic women of American rock and blues and music history. And it never that particular exhibit never really felt right to me. Not the exhibit itself. The fact that to get back there you had to pay. I believe the the general admission was like twenty seven dollars, and then right. It's unclear. I can't remember if you had to pay extra to get back in the main into that exhibit or not. But regardless, it was a paid exhibit. And sure. when I look at those instruments in particular, to me. Those belong in like the Smithsonian because they're part of American history. Right. They're part of our yeah. culture. They're part of our artistic contribution to the world. And specifically in, in cases like Sister Rosetta Tharp and Elizabeth Cotton, they're civil rights history, right? Like right. those women were around and making music around the time of the American civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. Um, yeah. And so the fact that like in order to see that stuff and and to kind of hear those stories and everything you had to you had to pay a pretty significant amount of money right. for a lot of people, you know. Um yeah. To me that that real that really felt weird. Um it, and for any international audience or listeners, if you've never been to DC and like been to the Smithsonian, the Smithsonian is open, it's free. There's no you don't pay to yeah. get in. Um, it's, it's a public, yeah, it's amazing. It's a public exhibition. And so to me, I feel like that kind of stuff, if it's, if it's part of American history and, and civil rights history and our culture, like it, it shouldn't be behind a pay wall, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Cause was it, was it two years ago at like the Met? And I think it, I think it toured around, I think it was in California and came to New York. They had Jimmy Page's number one. And um, Eddie's Franken's Frankenstrat Frankenstein, and like a few, uh, you know, famous guitars were touring around, and I, I knew I knew a lot of people that actually like made the trek to see it. Yeah, and that I mean that's pretty incredible. I know I think, well I think in in um, Guitar Center in like L.A. you can see Clapton's three thirty five. I think it's there, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Guitar Center owns it. Um, yeah, I I saw it last year right. at Crossroads. They had it out there at Crossroads. Sure. So, I mean, I just, I just think that you're right. Like those things do belong, um, it, like in a, in a public place for people to come and, and, and experience that. I mean, and I guess a lot of museums, cause the, I don't think the country music hall of fame in Nashville is, it's not free. I'm sure it's paid, but at least it's, it's in a place where people can get to it. I feel like one of the biggest downfalls of songbirds was its location in Chattanooga. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I feel like they 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 would have survived if they had been in Nashville or Atlanta or you know somewhere a larger hub. Yeah, um, but but yeah, it's just an interesting thought because you know I I've heard stories from very reliable sources that have seen really famous guitars that are just in a sad state, like um, Stevie's number one or first wife or whatever you know his main Sunburst Strat was that guitar apparently is just, it's not playable. It's not even, you know, it's really sad. And that's a shame because that guitar deserves to be seen by everybody who loved and respected Stevie's body of work and his contribution to guitar playing. Well, it's part of their yeah. legacy, man. And I think that's yeah. that's unique to musicians in terms of like the the world of art in general. You know, I, I you know, we don't have like, I mean, maybe we do. I don't know. I'm speaking out of my ass here, but like, we don't have Picasso's easel, you know, or right, or yeah. um, you know, Da Vinci's chisels and hammers and stuff like that, right? right. But we do have, you know, Clapton's 335. We do have Eddie's Frankenstrat. We do have Page's Les Paul, and so I think. Mm-hmm that's part of their legacy and it's part of their story as artists. And, you know, the one thing like as an American, the the one thing I am really proud of this country just in general is, is our contribution to the world in terms of art in, in jazz and blues. Like those are, those are American art forms. You know, they came from 
a pretty dark place that came from yes. um, yeah. slavery and, and, um, you know, a really, really like make no bones about it. Like <laughs> blues and jazz and, and the culture that, that surrounded those, uh, those art forms came from a, a place of really bad pain and suffering in a pretty evil place, but it's part of our 100%. history. And I think what's beautiful about it is through all of that shit uh, was birthed one of, I think, the greatest art forms of all time, you know. Right. And that is a that is an American contribution to the world. And to me, right. you know, when I see going back to like the Songbirds, Songbirds exhibit, specifically... Sister Rosetta Tharp. That woman is uh, one of the unsung heroes of rock and roll, right? Like she Absolutely. was, she, yeah. what she was doing on guitar was like way ahead of her time and, and way ahead of what almost anybody else was doing at the time, right? Um, yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of other artists get credit um, that I believe Sister Rosetta Tharp deserves. And so to actually be there, I, I could not believe that I was like looking at her SG, like just right there behind a pane of glass. And right, then yeah. I was, I was really put off by like, oh man, it costs, you know, it costs a chunk of money just to get in here to see this thing. Like, why is this not in the, sure. the African American History Museum in DC? You know what I mean? Like, yes. Yeah. yeah. I, th I think there is, you know, there's, there's a conversation that has to be had about whether the artist is still living or, or is, you know, no longer with us about where those pieces belong. Because to me, that's the biggest shame is, you know, if it's with the family, that's one thing. Cause I know Jimmy has Stevie's Jimmy Vaughn has Stevie's strap. Like that's yeah. awesome. You know, he should, he 100% should have it, but something like sister Rosetta Tharp's SG it does it like it belongs where people can see it. I mean, not to say it shouldn't belong with their family or, you know, and you know, all of that, but you know, just what, what it means and what, what people, they might not know how influential she was. Like it, it deserves to be saying, you're right. There should be uh, an American music history portion of the Smithsonian. I mean, I'm sure there is musical instruments and stuff there, but I don't, I don't think it's anything close to that. Well, there is in uh, the African American history museum, in uh, right. DC, which I, I got to go to last year, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. There is a a musical exhibit, like the African American sort of musical sort of contribution, which is, to be honest, a like huge, huge part <laughs> of right. American music culture just in general. So it was really cool, and they have a bunch of of amazing stuff there. Um, but yeah, I would I would love to see that, man. I'd love to see a an American based Smithsonian like music and art museum kind of thing. I think that would be killer. The other part of this conversation right. is like, at what point does an instrument transcend a collectible item and become sort of a piece of history that needs to be preserved, right? Like what's, where's the line there and how do we decide, yeah. you know, what gets preserved and, put behind a pane of glass uh and what gets sold around to collectors and things like that yeah that you know that that is it's hard to put that into a tangible term because influence is so personal but like 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 okay last week we talked about billy gibbons broadcaster right cool guitar famous song but arguably 99 percent of people never you know, knew he ever played that guitar. And I would argue right. that most people only know him for playing like the big fuzzy, you know, explorers yeah. and stuff like that. Um, but something like, you know, Eddie's Frankenstrat, like how many people did that inspire to, to go down the path of music, you know, because they right. saw him and everything he was doing and like, it was done on that. Like, that's like, to me, that's, it's right up there with, you know, any other burst, as far as being yeah. influential, you know, you're looking at a handful of instruments, in my opinion, that shaped the course of music history. And, uh, you know, really after like Jimi Hendrix's like Woodstock Strat, I'd say Eddie's Frankenstrat is probably one of the most, you know, and Buddy, Buddy, Buddy Holly's Strat, like, you know, those things are like so influential because when they were seen by the American people, it like, well, by the world, it just like sent a shockwave through people. And yeah. 
changed how they perceived yeah. music. Clapton's 335, I'd, I'd put up there too. You know, not obviously not as an American thing, but people like you don't don't forget the the uh, influence that Clapton had on people right. in the in the sixties around London. Well, like I'd put I, Jeff I would Beck's say, Strat up there too. I would say that Clapton's full SG is way more iconic. Mm. I mean, not to say that the three thirty. I mean, uh, the three thirty five. Like the the what I've heard of him playing that. That's my favorite. But like when you think about how how many how many good what what guitars were a shock to people's systems like what stuck with them you know the fool and blackie you know like yeah you, you, you freaking open slow hand and there's blackie in there it's like uh yeah it's pretty incredible yeah you know? man that's there's so many examples of that too so it's like yeah what at what point do you and i guess it, it comes down to the owner of the guitar whether it's a family member whether it's the estate or whether it's some collector Right. It comes down to the owner to, you know, say, okay, this, this now needs to become a part of history. Um, and in some cases I feel like there is an obligation to do that kind of stuff, you know, like, uh, Carol Kay's bass, like, I, man, that shouldn't be in somebody's collection. Right. Like that. Think of, think of how many people have heard that bass. When, right. you, when you think yeah. of like what she played, like the bass lines that she came up with playing that bass on those sessions, like, dude, that, mm -hmm. that doesn't belong in some mansion somewhere locked away. You know, right. uh, to me, that absolutely needs to be shared. It needs to be out there for people to see because it's only, it's only good for the music. It, it only helps to extend the legacy and to turn people on to, to new things and, or, or to that stuff, right? To turn new generations on to the older stuff. It's the same conversation, you know, Rick Beato talks about this all the time with the blockers and everything. Uh -huh. like right now on, on TikTok, there's this big thing happening. Um, Fleetwood Mac's Dreams has gone viral again because of this, right. this like weird TikTok video. And it was allowed to do that because um, Stevie Nicks isn't a blocker. She doesn't block any of this, this of her songs whereas Lindsay Buckingham is a blocker and it's just this thing of like man at some point the stuff needs to be shared so that new generations can can find it and learn sure. about it you know absolutely yeah totally yeah yeah anyway and and that goes into the whole collector sort of thing too it's which I, I kind of get I, I'm in a weird place about some of like people that have the massive guitar collections. I mean, it is impressive. And it's yeah. one thing to own like some vintage stuff or, or a bunch of vintage stuff and everything. But when you get into the, the, what we're talking about, like artist owned legacy instruments, that yeah. to me is a little weird. I think, you know, like there's some people that do it right. Like Chris who owns uh Kossoff's burst, you know, he, he had it at songbirds. He has an Instagram and shows this stuff and he, he takes it to Paul Rogers <laughs> And like reconnects these pieces with the the people that that knew it, and you know that I think is is important. Like it's one thing to have it and just have it sitting in a closet or on a stand, and no one even knows you own it. And it's another thing to like uh, have the duty to to keep it visible for people to see and learn and, and experience in a way. Yeah, man, interesting, interesting discussion. People in the chat are into this right now. Yeah. Um, Calky Das said uh, we should open a campaign, a petition for the White House to ask for it. Once a petition passes a certain amount of supporters, the White House takes action into this matter. Sure, we we might Let's start a museum, you guys. <laughs> yeah, we should probably wait. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, yeah. That's um. What's uh? What's next on our list here? Well, the next thing. Pull it up. Was. Coming to the dark side because I, I mean, everyone, <laughs> I think most people in here know what I got, but recently I purchased the uh, Stomp Trooper version of yep. the HX Stomp, which I, I'm going to be honest, I wasn't sure I was going to be happy with this. When, when I ordered it, I was like, you know, this roll in the dice. But since I've got it and, and, since I've been able to plug it into my computer and 
uh, play it through these, you know, monitors and stuff. I've had more fun playing guitar and creating sounds than I have in a long time. And to me, that immediately makes this purchase worth it, like unequivocally. So, yeah, but they're really they're good, in- man. There's such a stigma about digital modeling, and so even still, and I know that you're a big proponent of 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 this stuff, but you know, I I kind of live in a weird spot where I, you know, I make little analog boxes that don't, you know, most people would never consider me to even dream of playing something like this, and this has just been so inspiring. And like I said, I've been having so much fun. Remember fun, you know, and that's just where I'm at. With it. <laughs> Remember fun that thing we used to have about a year ago? Oh, Jesus. Um man, okay, I'm happy to hear you say that. I'm not like a proponent of modelers. Um I'm a proponent of whatever gets you playing guitar and gets you excited about playing guitar and gets you inspired sure. to play. Sure, sure. So for a lot of people now, that is the modelers because a lot of people live in apartments or don't have the ability to, to crank up even a 10 or 15 watt tube amp and get yeah. it to where they want. A lot of people don't have the money to be able to buy a ton of different amps and, and things that they want. So these modelers that are coming out, the stomp right now, I think is, I think the stomp is the best modeler on the market. I don't think it's the best sounding. Sure. I don't think it's the best uh, the, the, has the most features. I don't think it has, you know, it's not the perfect modeler, but when you look at the size, the price, the capabilities, I think it's the best modeler on the market. Yeah. I mean, that is, may change. Right. Is there anything well, else you, living in that? Is there anything else living in that price range that even comes close to the, the feature set and the quality though? You know? I don't think so. Not yeah. currently, but that's the thing about modelers, right? It's like any other technology. Now there's not give it a year, right. you know, and, and then everyone will be selling off their stomps for the next, the next greatest thing. That is, right. that is a downside of like the digital world. You know, you buy a tube amp and if you buy a good tube amp, you know, it's going to hold its value right? and yeah. it's going to be valued. It, it'll fluctuate. It'll go up and down. Sure. But it's not like there's going to be a new Morgan AC20 that comes out and all the old AC20s are pretty much now obsolete. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's it's been really fun. People are asking if I've been using your presets. I have, but for me, the biggest the the funnest part is just creating my own. And I haven't really used it in front of my amp. It's like I don't I didn't buy it for that. I have pedals for that, you know. Like I have what I like. Right. I, and so for me, it's what I've been trying to do is actually dive in and recreate like sounds that I can't achieve like with my stuff. Yeah. Like, I mean, of course I've been doing, I've been listening to like records and copying like ZZ Top, but also trying to get like Weezer's first record guitar sound, which is like a Mesa Mark one prototype through a giant orange cab, you know, like those sort of things like that. Right. That's not feasible. It's not possible, you know? So that sort of thing has been so fun and inspiring. And it makes me want to play guitar more and like put loops into logic and jam and like kind of get inspired and, and practice it, which is like, you know, that's for me, the hardest thing is like, cause we've, we talked about this so many times, like the, the actually having to physically plug things in is mm-hmm. it just stops you. And the fact that this has a headphone jack and I can just plug it in and plug a guitar cable in and power it up and it's done. Granted that power core yeah. is the biggest thing on the face of the earth, but it's dumb. <laughs> it's dumb. But it, I, <laughs> the uh, oh, here I have one right here. Okay, line six, guys. What the hell is this? <laughs> okay, this is this is stupid. This is stupid. Why is it shaped like this? Okay, why is it? Let me make sure I'm in focus here. Did we? For anyone talk that doesn't this? know, this is the. I don't think on the pot we've talked about it right together. But I don't think on the pod. This is the power inverter for the stomp and for the uh, HX effects. What <laughs> the hell, man? <laughs> like, I get it that you need you need special power requirements. They, they, you know, it's a little bit more difficult to power than just like 
off a regular power supply, but why is it shaped this way? Right. It's the most impractical, stupid shape <laughs> for a... Uh, it, God. Okay. It, when I, and the cable's not long enough. Right. It's really short. That's the other thing. When, when I got it out of the box, like, did you have an, uh, an Xbox 360? Yes. Do you remember the gigantic yep. power brick that came with that? Yep. That's what I felt like. I was like, <laughs> what on earth is coming out of this box? <laughs> so... <laughs> But all that to say, yeah. I, I, I've, I've rarely, I've, I've not been touching my guitar amps as much. I mean, like when I've been getting all these pedals, like the, I've been prepping for the analog delay, I've been playing it. But most of the time now, I'm just playing that, and I feel, it feels good, you know, it feels good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I, I get it. It's not for everybody. That's fine. I'm not saying it is for everybody. Um but there's definitely something to be said for the practicality and the convenience. And, you know, at the end of the day, if it's 80% as good as the real thing, that's good enough for most people. And that's, what's going to be getting them to play their guitar and to pick up and learn and practice and get better and enjoy the instrument. And you know what? That's, that's good, good enough. Do you think, and if you're on the other end of that spectrum, sorry, Oh no, go ahead. if you're on the other end of that spectrum and you're, uh, you know, to you playing guitar through a Marshall half stack cranked is what makes you happy by all means, man, whatever blows your skirt up. Right. Do, do you think that the stigma against modeling is pretty much gone away? Uh, yeah. If it's not completely gone, I think it's, well, it's not, it's definitely not completely gone. <laughs> right, right. Um, uh, you know, there, there's plenty of, there's plenty of, uh, old guard, <laughs> guys out there that just look down their noses at any at just about anything well, but yeah. i think even a lot of those guys um at least the conversation has shifted now to where it's no longer like oh get that get that shit out of my face right. so now it's like look i get it it's just not my thing you know yeah it, which is fine it's no longer the kidney bean pod it's 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 evolved so much so much right um so yeah i don't know i'm excited um it, it's really good and and there's um well i have to be careful because i'm under an nda so there's stuff coming that's my my point is this whole progression is this whole like industry is just getting better and better they're getting better at the sounds they're getting better at implementing stuff they're getting i mean it's in five years i think most people most new guitar players may not be playing modelers and stuff exclusively, but I think most guitar players will have some kind of modeler somewhere in their setup. Right. You know, there's, there's this argument and, and, and I think it's very, really valid that tubes are eventually going to go away because there's only a few places mm. making them. You know, I think there's like one major factory in Russia or maybe two. And I, I think they make like almost everybody's tubes. You know, I, it's it's Russia and China. Yeah, yeah, China. Of course. There's a couple places in China. I talked to Dave Friedman about this. Oh, really? The, that tone talk, and because I had the same question, I was like, "Are you worried about tubes going away?" He said, "No." Mm. Um, he said, "There's still enough industry out there because you have to think like tubes are still used in other areas other than just consumer audio like what <laughs> stuff, uh, lasers." Uh, so yeah, okay. there are freaking yeah, there, there are still like two <laughs> lasers man there's still two powered lasers out there that are used like in the medical world mm. um and in whatever other worlds you need like super high powered lasers for and shit like that that's and also that's crazy. A, um a, a big part of the russian military still a lot of their equipment is still tube driven yeah isn't that because it's russia bananas <laughs> <laughs> like could you imagine stepping into like an airplane that was going to fly across the ocean and you saw a panel off the wall and there's vacuum tubes in there and you're like wait a minute <laughs> can i hold on can i get my bag yo off dude this plane? is that a yo is that a bugle boy like, what is <laughs> that is that like a 12 x 7 sweet man is that a, a black glass rca what you got back there <laughs> what you got back there are those matched <laughs> man those are sweet are those new old stock oh my god could you imagine stepping on a plane and it's like uh, like a, a a technician like tube testing tubes before they like go in. they have like the big like tube tester thing and they're like cranking knobs you're like wait a minute hold no 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 I'm gonna drive <laughs> hold on <laughs> 
Yeah. I mean, yeah, there, I, I don't know that tubes level will ever completely go away, but I think the thing that we are seeing now is, um, and I've seen this. So, um, the, the amp nation amps, mm. um, he's using, he's using both JJ's and GT's groove tubes. Oh, really? Traditionally, I don't, I don't use groove tubes. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of the groove yeah, tube yeah. stuff. And I've had, okay. So just in the past three weeks, the six V sixes in my tweed clone, I blew one of those, the six V six in the, um, the Dumble clone. One of those blew. It wasn't the amp. There was literally like a uh, fracture somewhere in the tube and oxygen got into it. Oh. Because you could see the white, yeah, yeah. milky stuff inside the sure. tube. Um, Taylor from Amp Nation sent me another amp to check out, the Amplifonics and Gain. That had an EL84 that went bad and blew a fuse in the amp. So what we're seeing now is tubes, like the just the quality is taking a nosedive i mean it's really and this is what dave friedman was saying is like it's really hard to find good tubes like you'll, sure. you'll get an order of tubes and there's a not insignificant number of them that are just bad yeah out of the box i, I my favorite tubes um while we're on the subject are the tad tube amp doctor tubes because yeah those are yeah great. He, he like really they're they're kind of you know they're a little bit more expensive but they test them and they're like I've never had a problem with those but you know what's really funny when I had I had a Friedman Dirty Shirley and uh, the V1 which if you don't know in most amplifiers V1 kind of sets the input gain uh, so it kind of can shape how much distortion you're getting from the preamp and I had a buddy that worked at Carter gave me like a bunch of old like 12 AX7s like Mullards and you know tongue soles like good ones. And the best one in that yeah. app was the Chinese one that came with it. And it sounded awesome. <laughs> I don't know why. It just, it sounded the best. So. Yeah. Yeah. But I do, I think there is something to, um, I, I'm probably going to start, I'm not going to stockpile tubes, but I am going to start just buying stuff and holding on to it. Yeah. You know, like when next time I order tubes, I'll probably just get a couple extra just to have, <laughs> gonna, you know, you're just going to like, Go into the basement of the house you buy it. It's just like cartons of cigarettes and packs of tubes. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Here in America, people stockpile ammunition, <laughs> and I'm I'm gonna stockpile six v sixes and twelve ax sevens. <laughs> man. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. But I think that is something to to think about, man. It's like if we do get to the point where. Tubes are not necessarily scarce, but it is harder and more expensive to find. I will like I looked at some new old stock stuff on um, Tube Depot the other day, and the prices of new old stock stuff have exploded yeah. over the last year. Like Bugle Boys and stuff have blown up. Well, so it. I mean, buying yeah. it from them, they you're you're not rolling the dice, which I think is. Yeah, partly true. why they're so high because when like if you just go on eBay and like find some and you get them, they could very well be bad. But you buy them from you know Tube yeah, Depot, true. you know it's going to be good. And I think, but you're right, man. Like, and like the bigger the glass, you know, the more expensive. Like you look, you look at like KT sixty sixes or eighty eights, and like new old stock ones are just insane how much they cost. But I don't know. So. Yeah, I think I think there will come a time where you'll probably think twice about bringing your tube amp out to a gig, right? Because you know if they do get a little harder to find, a little bit more expensive, um, then you know it's like okay, cool, yeah, maybe maybe I leave the the nice tube amp at home for the bar gig and save it, you know, for whatever, and I bring my whatever out the. Axe Effects 7 or whatever it is, you know. <laughs> right, right. It's um, just going to be like Kemper headphones and it has a Bluetooth that goes oh, to God. the... <laughs> <laughs> and you're just play, you look like the guitar player from Linkin Park. Uh, <laughs> man, what what do we think Kemper's next move is, man? Because this thing's almost 10 years old. I think it's going to be... A, uh... I, I think it's going to be a more compact version of basically what they're making, but like I mean, like way more processing power, and I think you're gonna see them 
really kind of like dive into putting more effects and flexibility to like in front of the models. Um, yeah. But I mean, I, I've never, I've played them, but I've never owned one. So I don't even know. I mean, the, the thing about Kempers for me is everyone says they take pedals great and they do all this and that and they do, but they don't react the same as an amp getting a pedal in front of it. And I feel like if they can get more of that, right, that's going to be more interesting to me. What, so what is it about um, what is it about a modeler to you that doesn't take pedals the same way? Well, granted, this was a a couple of years ago. It was right after one major update for the Kemper, and I was playing it, and I was like, hey, you know, this sounds pretty good through like an F FR, you know, whatever cab. Um, yeah. And I just had like a, I think we had a Mjolnir in front of it, and it just we were playing an amp that I kind of knew. I think it was more like a a tweed like a basement or something and it 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 got louder but it didn't feel like i didn't feel that the amp giving back how like when you're hitting a real amp with a lot of volume you, you feel that compression it's like it's a tangible relationship and that didn't seem to exist to me but this was years ago so i don't know if mm. they've changed it since then because like it I, i'm not saying it sounded bad and and it definitely like took it and sounded good, but to me, you know, having such an intimate knowledge of how my things interact with amplifiers didn't feel didn't feel the same. So that brings up another point. You you were telling me when you first got the stomp, you changed the input impedance and you said it totally opened it up. Do you yes. think it has something to do with that? Maybe. Uh, you know, and is that something you can change on the Kemper? Can you change the input impedance? Uh, no. Oh. We should mod it though. We should we should start clipping <laughs> caps and resistors and <laughs> mod the Kemper. Just tacking resistors <laughs> onto it. Yeah. Oh no, man, I, I'm surprised nobody's attempted that before. But yeah, I'm sure someone has. I, I, I love like seeing. I love finding on Craigslist things that people have worked on and they show their work, and it's like whoa, I kind of want to buy it so I can just document this train wreck, you know? <laughs> what? What's the worst? What's the, I'm trying to think of how to pose this question. What's the most ramshackle thing you ever played? Or have you ever played something that when you actually got into it, you were like, there's no way this is actually working the way it's supposed to? Um... No, I did get electrocuted by a super reverb at Guitar Center one time. So that <laughs> that um it happened twice. It was a it was a 60 65. It was a blackface, maybe 64 blackface super. Two prong. And I I yep, two prong, plugged it up. Guy at Guitar Center was like, "Oh dude, totally meant, totally meant. Sounds great, totally original, never in touch, blah blah blah." Plugged it in and went to flip it off a of standby and it zapped me. I was like, yo, this thing, it's like, Hey man, this thing just elect. it's like, it's hot. It's, you know, he's like, no, 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 man, it's cool. It's cool. It's fine. So I went and, and did it again and like got zapped. So I imagine that one had some, uh, maybe the death cap was, was bad. In it. I don't know. So, uh, there was, there's a buddy of mine and he was selling some stuff online and he had this cool amp. It was called a 007. Uh, if I can find a picture of it, I'll. Oh man, that's cool as hell, man. Man, like that's good. Yeah. Put it in the back of your Ashton Martin, drive it down the <laughs> dirt road. <laughs> but uh, I was like, that thing looks so cool because it was like a sparkly blue Tolex, and it was just neat. And so I was doing some research on it, and it didn't have a power transformer. It it took the wall voltage and dropped it through caps to hit the tubes, and I was like. That's the most dangerous what? thing I've ever heard. Because <laughs> if one of those cap shifts, oh, you're getting God. full current, and it's just gonna everything in the circuit's gonna go. Oh, my light died behind me. <laughs> uh, people don't don't mess with tube amps, please. No, they're no. they're really dangerous. Like don't ju don't just go cracking your tube amp open and thinking you're gonna you're gonna mod it and do all this stuff. They're <laughs> they're super dangerous. <laughs> my my favorite. <laughs> rat's nest i ever saw <laughs> i say favorite it was just the most shocking i had a buddy that bought this baseman replica and when i took the back off of it it was like you know a, a 59 410 basement kind of thing 
And right. the guy who made this amp didn't uh, trim any of the leads. So all the wire, he just like spun it around and shoved it into the the uh, the chassis. And it didn't work, obviously. But there was I, I went through and tried to fix it. And there was just like 10 feet, like so much wire just <sighs> like inside here. It was a nightmare. And that'll make the amp uh, noisier too, right? Because oh, it's yeah. essentially, you've got way more copper in there. It's going to be picking up RF and, and all kinds of stuff. There, there are very specific ways as to route signal. Uh, it's something I do in pedals. It's something that a good amplifier builders do. It's one of the reasons why Ken Fisher's train wreck amps are so good and so quiet because he was a master of routing. And if you ever look inside a train wreck, I'll try to post this picture, it's meticulous and it's incredible how he would right angle and avoid crossing things because you want your signals usually to cross um, perpendicular. You don't want them to run parallel. You don't want them to like cross diagonally. You just want them to cross and be done um, for the least interference. But it's, man, yep. uh, when it's done right. Yeah, think about that with your pedal boards at home, everyone. When you're putting your pedal boards together, keep especially your signal cables and your power cables. Never run them next to each other. If they have to cross, make them cross at a, at a perpendicular 90 degree angle yeah. and you'll you'll drastically cut down noise yeah. on your board it, it's it's sometimes it doesn't make sense when you're trying to route things but it, it, it definitely is worth the added effort i'm so disappointed in this do you light. know anybody bought, with a train wreck uh yes <laughs> um i bought this light you do yeah of course oh, i do <laughs> i bought this, this what, what light do you mean of podcast. course i do that, that listen listen <laughs> Of course I do. Dude, that's like one of the most rare and sought after amps of all time. And you're out here like, oh, yeah, dude, of course I do. We, you're like insulted that I would even ask if you know someone with a train wreck. No, 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 no. No, it's my my buddy who has the uh, the Dumble and the stuff, all the nice stuff. Uh, We should, because the train wreck's on my, my list of videos to do, like, what is the sound? What is the train wreck sound? So if possible uh, next week we should bring, make that a thing bring your headphone or your earplugs because i have never heard a louder amplifier as a train wreck well great save for like a, a like a marshall major or something you know but like yeah they 200 are, watt major they, they're just the train wrecks are so loud but but yeah i mean i can i can try my best to facilitate that <laughs> hell yeah well, nice. Uh, all right, we'll wrap up here in just a second. What uh, we'll take some questions, I guess, from chat. What were you about to say? I cut you off. Oh no, uh, I was gonna. We were gonna talk about that Collings you played, but I don't know. That might be a little <gasps> too long winded. Yeah. It's up to you. No, no, we can talk about it. Sure. Briefly, I forgot about it. So yeah, I went to um, one of my favorite local shops, Atlanta Discount Music. Um, I'll just uh, shill for them real quick. Um. Yeah, so they're they're one of like the old school shops in Atlanta, and it's one of those things where I think everyone has this kind of guitar shop around where you go in. You you, you know you might go in once a month or whatever, and every time you go in, there's like a bunch of different stuff, so you kind of never know what you're gonna see when you go in there. And uh, yeah. this week I walked in, and they have a killer selection of guitars in right now. Like they've got some really cool shit in there right now, and. Um, uh, they had a Vox AC-15. It was a Korg era, um, but it wasn't a early 90s. It was a 2000, so that, that one wasn't built by Marshall. But at the time, I thought it was, so I was playing it. And I picked up this Collings Electric. Uh, what's the model? It's their Les Paul, basically. What's the model on that one? Uh, the City Limits? Yeah, dude. Okay, this one was used. It was on consignment. I think they were asking like thirty four hundred bucks for it, um, but that's, that's about right. <laughs> it was perfect. It was perfect. If you've never played a Collings, acoustic or electric, the fit and finish on those things is unparalleled. I mean, it's astonishingly how how it's astonishing how good those guitars are put together. Yeah, yeah. They we would get them used through Carter. Uh, mostly I 35s, mm -hmm. but every time one came in, I was like, I have to get one of these because the city limits is kind of like, I think when you look at it, it looks a little funny, mm -hmm. like when it's hanging on the wall. Right. But when you actually 
get it in your lap, it looks more, it's like, it's weird how it looks weird like this, but when you turn it, it looks more normal. Yeah. Um, but man, just like it, it's, it's one of those upper echelon guitars. It's like that competes with an R9. Yeah. Yeah. You know, every day of the week. Yeah. So people are asking for good Gibson alternatives. That's, I mean, that's like cream of the crop, you know, right underneath some crazy master built, you know, like small luthier thing. Oh, as far as like a company goes, yeah. Callings. Yeah. It's about as good. That would be my, instead of a PRS, I would probably go with a Callings. Um, I think sure. to me, it's, it's just a better, the, the, at least the, I've played a bunch of their acoustics um, and their acoustics are like amazing. It, it's, it's yeah, astonishing. Really fantastic. Astonishing. And uh, Anthony DaCosta, mutual friend of ours, he's a big Callings guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, he and I were, sure. I was texting with him before we went on and he was, he was, uh, he's got one, he's got a city limits at home and, um, yeah, man, it was so good. So yeah, if you're, if you, uh, don't want to buy a Gibson and you can't stomach a PRS, check out a Collings. If you have the wallet for it. <laughs> if you have the wallet. Yeah. It's, it's not a Gibson USA alternative and it's not like a, a PRS core model alternative. It's definitely in like the custom shop level, but. Boy, is yeah, it good. Custom shop, private stock. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as far as other brands, you know, Heritage makes a great guitar. They just released a new one that's kind of like their R9. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you saw that, uh, which is cool. You know, it's good. They should be doing that. But at the end of the day, you know, just it, Heritage. if you don't like what a call or what a what a heritage looks like, then you're not going to like it. Well, and, and heritage too. Like, yeah, they, they make a great guitar for sure. But, uh, there's a couple at righteous right now and I, I played them and there's just some weird fit and finish things like, um, on their three thirty five or whatever their three thirty five equivalent is called. Uh, the, um, yeah. In the lower F hole on both of the ones they have at righteous right now, the lower F hole, the wiring, they have the wiring for the pots just going across the F hole. So you can just you just look what? at it and you see wires coming across, and it's it's from the factory that way. There's also some weird like the nut was filed weird on one. It just it didn't have, it didn't have the, the fit and finish that I was kind of expecting. It was a little rough around the edges. Yeah, I mean, I've only played uh, some heritage from like I don't know probably five or six years ago. And I always found them to be really heavy mm-hmm. and the neck shape to not be as comfortable as it should be. It kind of had like a D profile where it was not super thick, but it had like a, a thick uh, edge, you know? Yeah. Um, but granted, I've not played them since they're, they were recently acquired by, you know, the company that owns Mono and... Um, yeah, and Band Lab. Tysco and all. Yeah, Band Lab um, owns but, uh, Heritage, Tysco, um, Harmony... They own Guitar oh. Magazine now, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. and Mono. Yeah, that's all. Mono. Yeah, and they're from Singapore. Yeah, yeah, but uh, you know, the only other ones I can think of that most people bring up is you know stuff like the Eastman. And while Eastmans I think are the Eastman great are great for the money, they're good guitars for the money, but like it's it's not really apples to apples. No. Um, you know, I. I I know a lot of people. I know Nick Greer is a huge fan of the Eastman stuff, and they are good. But you know, I, I've played a bunch, and I think they're fine. But it it's 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 underneath the Gibson standard range, in my opinion. Yeah, and it's priced so. as such, right? So it's it's like right. You know, they're they're not co- trying to compete with Gibson standard line or anything. Um, Noah has had a couple of Eastmans over the years, and I've just been genuinely impressed at you know for whatever if the 750 to 1500 hundred dollar range i think is traditionally like where those guitars sit yeah dude for that money i don't think there's you know i would put revolta up there um and i would put i would say duesenberg should be in that category i think duesenberg should be in that price range they're not right um yeah yeah but as terms of build quality and playability and sound, I think Duesenberg is in that price range or in that that tonal range, whatever. But yeah, a lot of good stuff right. out there. Sure. Well, I mean, that's I mean, that's the only the ones that I can think of. You know, ultimately, right, um, right. If you don't want to support Gibson or Epiphone or whatever, yeah. which is is fine. Yep. Well, all right, everyone. 
This was another kind of uh, meandering episode, but I think we got some good topics in. I, we started with more topics than we did for the last one, so that's uh, that's a win win. <laughs> And and, uh, and I didn't have an anxiety attack over my stupid fence, so that's good. <laughs> that's good. That's good. As soon as we're yeah. done, then you can have your your breakdown. But you know, oh, it's it's but... coming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thanks everyone in the chat for hanging out. Uh, great turnout today. You guys are awesome. And don't forget, if you want to join the chat for one of our next episodes, you can uh, join our Patreon starting at two bucks a month, which is real cool. Uh, link easy, down below. Easy. You know, check out our plugs um, for everything we were talking about that I can't remember in the episode now because it's been an hour. Slides, uh, my new delay pedal. Yo, yeah, yeah, the new delay know. pedal. Hey, am I going to be able to play that but, next yeah, week? It, oh, yes. Yeah, it'll be here when the episode goes up. So, Killer. But uh, people want. have been asking about merch, working on it. Honestly, until <laughs> all these other things get resolved, I can't uh, even open Illustrator right now. But... It's coming soon, I promise. <laughs> Merch is coming. So that's it. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone. Don't forget to subscribe and uh we'll see y'all next Monday. Bye. <laughs>